All right, guys, we're going to talk about two different things today. We're going to continue exploring the concept of arrays, and then we're going to get to the topic of classes. Now, you've heard of object-oriented programming, from control structures to objects. Well, at least it's on the cover of our book. Objects are made from classes. So we will learn what a class is and how you can use them. But first, we need to talk a little bit more about arrays. Now, once you have a set of data stored in an array, what can you do with it? Well, you can run through it and print them out. You could calculate a, uh, a sum and an average. That's about all we know how to do with them so far. So, search algorithms. How to locate an item in a list of information. There are two algorithms we will examine, linear search and binary search. Binary search is much faster than a linear search, but the data has to be sorted before you can do that. And binary has nothing to do with the zeros and ones that, we, that we've learned about previously. You know. <laughs> so a linear search is also known as a sequential search. Starting at the first element, you sequentially step through an array, examining each element until you locate the value you are searching for. So say this is your data. Say I declare an array like this. String names is equal to, and I put you know four names in it. Bob, Sam, Doug, and with Zelda players today, Link. Okay. Now I want to find out which position Doug occupies so that I can replace Doug with some other name. How do I do that? You know, yeah, we can eyeball it and go, oh, well, you know, it's the third one. So this is zero, this is one, this is two. I can just go, you know, names parentheses two is equal to, you know, Mario or whatever. Great. Now when we printed it out, it would print Bob, Sam, Mario, and Link. Oh, come on. But the only reason we were able to do that is because we knew that Doug was element number two, starting at zero, zero, one, two. We could search the array to find that element number. How do you do that? With a while loop or a for loop or something like that. I'm going to take a crack at coding one, and then we're going to hit the next page and see what they think. So, you know, what we could do is, you know, declare a bool and call it false. Maybe this is a bad idea. Maybe this isn't how we should do it. I think I won't even bother. I'm going to create a variable called index, and I'm going to set it equal to zero. And I'm going to enter a while loop while index is less than the length of the array. There's more than one way to count the index, you know, the length of the array. I'm going to hard code it to four at the moment and see if they have any better suggestions. What we will do is if names at that specific index is equal to Doug, then we have found our spot. We have found our desired index. So break. Woohoo, we've done it. Else we need to skip to the next index. And by the time we get down here, if index is less than the length of the array, then we found it. Found at, you know, index, and then print out the index number. Else, print out that we didn't find it. Now, I don't know why I didn't do this in Visual Studio. I'll probably wind up copying and pasting it in there. All right, so there's our search algorithm. There's you know, more than one way you could implement it. Lots of different ways you can code it. Some ways you know, would look more compact on the screen or whatever. But we kind of get the idea. Ooh, for once in my life, I wish I had a laser pointer. Let's just scroll this down if I can. Index is equal to zero. 
So now we're going to check if names at index is equal to done. Well, what is the element of position zero? <coughs> Did I hear someone say it? Bob. It's Bob. Everybody knows that, right? Because we start counting at zero, one, two, three. So the element at index number zero is Bob. <coughs> is Bob equal to Doug? No. Nay. So we come down here and we add one to the index. Index is still less than four, so we check again. What is the names at index one? Sam. Sam. He's the only one saying them. Y'all get this, right? Okay. So is Sam equal to Doug? No. Add one to index. Now index is equal to two. What's the value of position two? Doug. Well, is Doug equal to Doug? It sure is, so we break. We have found our index value. So if we wanted to change Doug to Mario, we could use that index position. And since it is less than the maximum, since it's less than four, it's a valid index. We could print found at index, you know, what position it was found at. Otherwise, we say could not find Doug. Before we actually crank up Visual Studio, and enter something like this, I want to see their version of a search algorithm again. So array num list contains a series of numbers. We search for the value 11. And then we search for 7. Well, 11. 17 equal to 11? No. Add one to index. Is 23 equal to 11? Nope. Add one to index. Is 5 equal to 11? Nope. Add one to index. Is 11 equal to 11? It sure is. So our index value is 0, 1, 2, 3. We break out of the loop. We found it. But now we're going to search for 7. Hint, 7 is not in that list. So search is 17 equal to 7? Nope. Add 1 to index 23? Nope. Search element 2? Nope. Search element 3? Nope. Search element 4? Nope. Search element 5? Nope. Search element six. No, we got all the way to the end of the list because we added one to index and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Once index is equal to seven, we exit our while loop. So we did not find it. That's a, that's a sequential search. That's a linear search. Linear means a line, just starting at the beginning and going all the way down. Here's our algorithm. Theirs is a little bit more complicated. That's okay. They create a variable called found. They create a variable called position, and then they create a variable called index. Maybe this is a little bit clearer. And while index is less than the number of elements and found is false, keep looping. So they wrote this so that it doesn't use a break statement. We may as well go ahead and do this. by reusing the same old one over and over. <laughs> I know we don't need C time. No, we don't need algorithm. We need the other two. Include IO stream, include string, using namespace, int main, return zero. Now let's declare an array of ints. I'm just going to call it IA for int array. And I'm going to initialize it with an initializer list. The values, just type in some numbers. Whatever. Don't have to copy mine. Now, if you have the same value more than once in here, it's going to find the index value of the first one. So I think I have 20 in there twice. So, you know, as it searches the array, it's going to hit that first 20. So their code for searching the array looks like this. They have a Boolean, and they call it found, and they set it equal to false. And they have an int, and they call it position, and they set it equal to negative 1. And that way, when the loop is done, 
if found is equal to true, then you know it was a valid search. I think that's slightly extraneous, but I'll live with it. Okay, goal is not to write maximally terse code. Alrighty, so we need a variable called index. We're going to set it equal to zero because that's the first value. I'm going to go do a spoiler alert and see what their way for determining the length of the array is. Yeah, okay, fine. We're going to hard code it tonight. Uh, we're going to make a variable called number of elements. We're going to just hard code that tonight at the moment. So const int num underscore l for number of elements is equal to 9. I could have called it array size. That would have been probably a better variable name. I was too influenced by their page. As a matter of fact, I think I will. Array size is equal to 9. All right, now we can do our while loop. Or we can make it a for loop. But anyways, while index is less than array size and which is two ampersands to shift seven, and found is equal to false. So once found is equal to true, it'll break out of this loop, or if index exceeds or equals array size, then it'll break out of this loop. the value that we are searching for. Why don't we put that in a variable as well? So string, no, we're searching for a number. Int value is equal to, what number do we want to look for? Let's look for 20, I mentioned 20. Okay, so value is equal to the value that we're searching for. So if our int array at position index is equal to value, and we have found it. So if we find it, if they match, we set our flag equal to true. And then we set our pause equal to the index value. After all that's done, we increase index by 1, index plus plus. This code could be optimized a little bit. In my opinion, we have at least one too many variables here. Two too many variables, really, but that's okay. Now their code wrote this as a function. We could turn this into a function. But first let's just make sure it works. So the last thing I'm going to do is say C out found at position POS. Found to position three. Okay. Now this would better be served as a function so that you could pass in any array, any value, and any array size, and it would search that array for the specific value that you were looking for. but I want to make sure everybody gets it running before I go and hack and slash it and turn it into its own function.
Okay, let's turn this into a function. To turn it into a function, I'm going to put little comments over here. This is, you don't have to do this. Into the things that we're going to pass in. I want to pass in the array size since I don't have a good way of asking it for the array size that I know of yet. I want to pass in the value to search for, so that's going to be a parameter. And like I said, you don't have to be doing these. And then I'm going to be passing in the array itself. So I'm going to cut all of this stuff. Come and paste it above main, and we're going to turn it into a function. So, what is it going to return? It's going to return a, uh, an int indicating the position. Let's call it search. What it is searching is an array of ints called IA. So now I can delete this IA thing. No, I can't. All right, what's next is the array size. That's also an int. And then lastly, the value we're searching for, which is also an int. Now I need to comment some stuff. I, I mean, tab it over. And then I need to put a return position at the very end. Return POS. I put the braces in the wrong place on INT. I did some Java syntax there, some C++ syntax. I need to move those braces to after the variable name. So in the uh, parameter list for the search function, it should say int space IA and then square braces, not, not the way I had it. I apologize for that mistake. All right, there's my search function. Be kind of nice if it was formatted prettier. I'm going to see if I can format it prettier by going under Edit, Advanced. <coughs> format document, but it doesn't look like it made any changes. <coughs> but if I can run it without getting any errors, I know at least I have it totally mangled it, but I have. <coughs> That's because where I call it down in main is not correct yet. I'm going to comment out the C out statement in main. So this is all I have. I'm trying to get it to the point where I can compile it and it won't say build errors, even though it doesn't print anything. Okay, so that's my search function. I have an error. That's cool. Let me come help. I mean, not cool, but you know what I mean. All right. So the arguments that we need to pass to the search parameter, the first one is the array itself, the second one is the size of the array, and the third is the value that we're searching for. So down here, I'm going to do something like this. int pos is equal to search, and the array that I declared is called IA. I decided that it was a length of 9, and I want to search for the value. I'm going to search for a different value now, 70, something in there. And then you can put that C out statement because we actually have a POS variable. Okay, I found it at position six. Good. I have an error. All right.
Bob is complaining about C out. Let's go see if we can figure out why. Everybody get that call to search successfully? We could write another version of it that would search for strings. You know, we could uh, write a loop that would let, you know, the user enter a number to search for, and it would search the array. But what I really want you to just have is the idea. I'm not going to ask you to write your own linear search function, you know, on an exam or anything. But this logic is awfully important. If you go on to do other programming, in computers, you do this a lot. If you don't have data sorted, then you can't use a sort call on something and magically have it find it. Once you do have data sorted, it's great. You know there are, are things you can do that will you know search the sorted data and sort and search it very quickly. But this array isn't sorted, so we just have to check it item by item. We start at zero, we go to the end of the array. If we've never found it, then we never set our flag to true and we just return a negative one. If we ever have found it, we set our indicator equal to the index value at which it was found. So that is searching an array. So the benefits. It's easy to understand. The array can be in any order. The disadvantages. It's inefficient. If your array is 100 elements long, then on average, it takes 50 turns to find the number. You know, over hundreds of searches or whatever. There are ways to search that are much faster, but it requires the data be, to be sorted. And that's what's known as a binary search. To do a binary search, it requires the elements to be in order. Now, y'all already have the idea of a binary search in your brain, whether you know it or not. Suppose you have the values A, C, F, H, J, K, and I'm looking for a J and an L. Sorry. What you do is you go to the middle item. Is that an L? No. Is L greater or less than H? Well, L is that way, right? So it's greater. Okay, so I jump over here. Is that an L? No. Is L greater or less than K? Greater. Go one more. There we go. So in three searches, we found it. Whereas with a linear search, it would have to take one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So you have that concept in your brain already, I am sure. The idea that you can narrow things down by half, and then if it's not there, you can narrow them down by half again. And if it's not there, there you go, you have found it. And that's what we did here. We cut the list into two halves and we checked the middle element. Is that correct? Great, we found it. If not, we go to whichever half we haven't checked yet or whichever half is appropriate. Now let's say that we're looking for F. We go to the middle element. Is that an F? No, it's not. Is F greater than or less than H? It's less than. So we go back. Now, the algorithm would have to decide which is the middle, you know. Let's uh, say it's that one. Is C equal to F? Nope. Is F greater than or less than C? It's greater, so it's going to go that way. Is F equal to F? Yeah. So again, it only took three searches to find it. So the idea of the binary search is you divide the array into three sections. The middle element, the elements on one side, and the element on the other. If the middle element is a correct value, you're done. Otherwise, you redivide it. You know, and by that I mean I was looking for F. This one wasn't right, so I went back over here and I picked a new middle element. And then I checked again. Continue with steps one and two until the, either the value is found or there are no more elements to examine. Now, I'm not going to walk through this or make us code it, but I want you to have that idea. Binary search requires the data to be sorted. Otherwise, how would we know which way to go? You know, we wouldn't know which way L was compared to H if we didn't know that it was sorted alphabetically. 
So for a binary search to work, it has to be sorted. The advantages of a binary search are that it's much faster. Finding that L would have taken seven chance, you know, seven searches, whereas finding it with a binary search took three. And if we were lucky and guessed right, you know, if it was in the middle, if we were searching for H, it found it in one search. Go to the middle. Is H equal to our target? Yeah, our target was H. Boom, we found it. We found it in one search instead of one, two, three, four, like a linear search would do. So here's our example. We're searching for the value 11. Well, we jump to the middle. Is 11 equal to 11? Yeah, it found it right away, so it stops. <laughs> now we're searching for 7. We go to the middle. Is 7 equal to 11? No. Is 7 greater than or less than 11? It's less than, so we got to go over here. We, we, this is our new range. We go to the middle one. Is 3 equal to 7? No, it is not. So is 7 greater than or less than 3? It's greater than. So now our range just consists of that. We check that one. Is 5 equal to 7? No, it is not. Is there anywhere else we can go? No, we're done. So we searched that one, we searched that one, we searched that one, we kept zeroing in. We kept chopping it in half until we found it. Here's some code for binary search. Memorize that. There, you got it done. No, I'm kidding. We're not going to code that. It's a good idea. The trade-offs, the benefits, it's much more efficient than a linear search. Disadvantages, it requires that the array elements be sorted which may not be a challenge, but then again, it may be a challenge. If you are keeping this data over time, then every time you insert a new element into the array, you could do a sort on the array. And if you're using an efficient data structure known as a linked list, it's real easy to keep the array sorted. But if you're not using a good data structure like a linked list, and you're saying, I'm using words that y'all aren't familiar with, if you haven't taken a data structures course, and that's fine. But if it's not an efficient data structure, then, it, then sorting the data is a really expensive process. So if you only sort one, if you only add data to your array once in a blue moon, but you do a lot of searches into it, then it's to your benefit to sort the data and to make it a linear search. However, if you only do a few search, searches, it doesn't matter that it takes a long time to do the search. All right, and then there's the idea of sorting. There are algorithms for sorting data, you know? But I don't feel like talking about them now because we wouldn't examine the code close enough to do it. The, uh, maybe we'll come back and hit it on Monday. One idea is known as the bubble sort. And the bubble sort is you keep comparing values and you push all the high values up to the very top. And then there are other kinds of sorts. I'm almost tempted to actually talk about it. But I want to go on to classes. Classes is a more important topic than sorting. But you could write a master's thesis on sorting algorithms. People actually spend a lot of time coding more and more efficient sorting algorithms and applying tweaks to get the maximum, the best performance possible. Why? Because doing searches is so often what computers do. You know, you have an array of census data, or you know, you have a database full of census data with you know 300 house, 300 million households in the U.S., and you want the database to give you you know one specific address. It has to be able to search that entire database and return that one record for you to see. So then you find out that you know, Joe Smith lives there. Well, that database is quote indexed, meaning that it has an index that it can traverse in a sorted order so it can do a fast search on it, you know, something fast like a binary search or perhaps even faster in order to find it. All right, the bubble sort. We will talk about this. The idea behind the bubble sort, you compare the first two elements. If they're out of order, exchange them. And then you move to the next element. You compare them. If they're out of order, you exchange them again. So we're going to do a bubble sort on some data. Let's make a new list that is just numbers. T. 
10, 19, 8, 7, and 20. No, 2. Okay. You check the first two values. Are they in order? Yeah, they are. We check the next two values. Are they in order? No, so we have to swap them. So now it becomes 10, 8, 19, 7, and 2. Now we check the next two values. Are they in order? No. no. So we swap them. Delete 7, put that there. All righty. Now we check these two values, 19 and 2. Are they in order? No. So we swap them. That's our first pass through the array. Now we start over. Notice that 19 got pushed all the way up to the top. Now we compare again. Is 10 less than 8? Are they in order? No, they're not, so we have to swap them. Is 10 less than 7? No, they're not, so we have to swap them. Is 10 less than 2? No, it's not, so we have to swap them again. Is 10 less than 19? It is, so we don't have to change those last two. All right, now we have to do it once more. And I cleverly arranged this so that we have to do the maximum number of swapping. That was not my intention. Okay, is, are these in order? No, so we swap them. Now we check these two. Are these in order? No, nope, so we swap them. Now we can check these. Are they in order? Yep. Are these two in order? Yep, cool deal. Everybody getting these, this idea? Uh, you know, only one person is answering, but I'm assuming that y'all are getting it. Okay, our next pass. Are these in order? No. No, okay. So what do we do? We swap them. How about these two? Are they in order? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now we do one final pass through it. This 2 and 7, are they correct? Yes, they are. 7 and 8, correct? Yes, they are. 8 and 10, correct? Yes, they are. 10 and 19, correct? Yes, they are. So we went through the entire array one time with no swaps. And when you can go through the entire thing with no swaps, you know you're done. So that is now a sorted array. You can see that was real repetitive, but that's what computers do best. You know, tiggers bounce, computers do repetitive things. That's the idea behind sorting. This one is known as the bubble sort. Why? Because each time the largest value propagated its way to the top. The first time the 19 went to the top. The second time we did it, the 10 went to its proper place. The next time we did it, the 8 went to its proper place. The next time we did it, the 7 went to its proper place. And then by then it was done. So bubble sort. <laughs> the larger values keep bubbling up to where they're supposed to be. And you can optimize it a little bit from uh, what I was showing, but that was the easiest explanation for it. Okay. There are other far more efficient sorts than the bubble sort. We haven't talked about vectors yet. Okay, we need to talk about classes and not next semester's classes. We need to talk about the concept of classes as they are in computer science. So we're skipping ahead a couple chapters. So basically two different types of programming, procedural programming and an object-oriented programming. If you took programming courses in the 80s or before, like I did, you learned procedural programming. So far, that's what we have learned in here, is procedural programming. It's a process, you start at the top of the program, you write the functions that main is going to call, you write main, and then you're done. So we just did a little bit of procedural programming. Object-oriented programming is based on the idea that you can group data and the functions that operated on it together. So. In the past, if we had wanted to write a program that would calculate the area of a circle, we would do something like this. We would say, you know, 
double radius is equal to 3, and then we would calculate the area. Area is equal to, you know, whatever, pi r squared. 3.14. One five nine times r times r, you know, pi r squared, and there we have it. This is an effective function conceptually, and this, in effect, is data. The way we've done this, we could only do it. We could only have one circle stored in our memory at a time. We only have one radius in our in our memory at a time. But we could create a circle object where each circle had its own radius value and each circle had an area function attached to it so that we can get the area for each circle at a time. And I'll, I'll give you an example, even though this isn't going to make a lot of sense. What if we could do this? Circle C1. Circle C2. C1 dot set radius. We're going to set the radius for that circle to 10. And in C2.setRadius, we're going to set the radius for that one to 20. And now if we wanted to print out those radiuses, we could do this. C out, you know, C1.getArea, followed by C2.getArea. If, if our class supported this, then we have written a class that contains data, in this case just a radius, and then a function called getArea. Now, a class can contain more than one piece of data. It can contain hundreds of pieces of data. You know, if you were going to write a class to represent a square, you'd have to know at least its height and its width. You might also want to know its starting position on the screen. If you're uh, you know, X, in the XY coordinates, if you were writing a graphics program, you might want to know the color of the square and the color of the border and how transparent it was. All of that would be data that would be contained in that class. Or say you have a printer class. You'd want to know whether the printer was on or off. That would need to be a variable. You would need to know how many pages were in the printer. That'd be another variable. You'd need some kind of queue, some kind of list of jobs that it was working on. That'd be another variable. Yeah. You'd need a variable to indicate that it was in an error state so it could flash the error or not. You know, that'd be another variable. All of those things would be inside the printer object so that when your program was trying to talk to the printer, you could check to see. Is printer empty? No, it's not. Is printer in an error state? No, it's not. And then along with that data, there would be some functions that were attached to it. Send a new job to the printer. Send a document to the printer. There'd be a send function. Something like that. That's my explanation for it. His explanation is that object-oriented programming is based on the data and the functions that operate on it. Objects are instances of ADTs that represent the data in its function. Well, that's clear as mud because we haven't seen the term ADT before. That stands for abstract data type. We're going to ignore that and keep going on. So the limits of procedural programming, the way we've been doing that. If the data structures change, many functions must also be changed. You know, we wrote a program that gathered somebody's height and their, and their you know, their age and we calculated their activity level and we got their basal metabolic rate out of it. You know, we had a bunch of variables in it. And so the programs are based on complex function hierarchies. You know, we had to have this information before we could call this function. We had to have this information before we could call this function. They're difficult to modify and extend. Now, we haven't written large enough programs for us to really find out that these are true, but they are. By the time you write a program that's several thousand lines long, if it's done in procedural programming, then you'll find out that it's difficult to make some changes to it. You know, you've written this program that's a video game and it supports, you know, Pac-Man running around and then later on you decide that you want to make it a three-dimensional program rather than two. You have to start rewriting almost the whole program in order to do that. Whereas if you've written it as an object-oriented programming, it becomes much easier because you identify specific things you can change in it. So object-oriented programming terms, you have a class. A class is a bundling of related variables and functions that act upon those variables. And an object is an instance of that class. Just like a variable is an instance of a data type. You have the variable name. It is an instance of string. You have the variable x. It is an instance of double or int or something like that. 
So the object is the instance of the class. We, you'll be hearing that word a lot over the lecture, you know, today and Monday. The class is the blueprint for it. If you want to build a house, you go and you buy blueprints for a house. That is your class. That is your blueprint. You don't have a house yet. Then you hire some constructor, some construction crew, and they go and they build that house for you. Now you have an instance of the house plans. You have an instance that has been created. You can move into that house. But you still have your blueprints, too. You can hand your blueprints over to your, you know, your sister, and then she can build a house from them. So one class can be used to create many, many different instances, many, many different objects, just like one set of blueprints could be used over and over to build houses. So our names, the attributes, are the data values of a class. Our circle had one attribute, or will have one attribute, and that's the radius. And then you have methods, also known as behaviors. And I'm sorry to give you multiple names, but the books always call these things differently. And those are the functions that operate on the class. So our circle class had one piece of data in it, which is a radius. And then it had one function, which was get area. So its attribute was radius, and its method, also known as its behavior, was get area. The way you define a class is you use a class keyword. So if I was going to def define a class called circle, I'm going to go and add this to my code up here. I would say class circle and um, good programming etiquette says that you name all your classes with an uppercase letter. Don't recall if that's if people in C++ follow that religiously. Yep, they do. Okay. So there's our class, but it doesn't have any data in it. Int radius. Now it does have a piece of data in it. Now let's make a function. Int get area. What does get area do? It returns pi times r squared. Except that's not an int, is it? Make it a double. Return 3.14159 times radius times radius. That's our class. A very, very simple class. It has one attribute. This is known as the attribute. It's also known as a member variable. Sorry, they have multiple names. Computer scientists can't ever make up their mind. And then this is known as a behavior or as a method. <coughs> a method is a function that's part of the class. The attribute or the member is data that's part of the class. Now I have my code here. I'm going to change this to main2 so that I can write a new main that, auto, that works on this. I can make a circle. Circle C1. That's just a reference to the circle. That's just a pointer to the circle. It's not the circle itself. It's not until I use the new keyword that it actually creates a circle. And I've botched the syntax for it, so I'm going to go back to the PowerPoint. So to define a class, you use the word class. You give it a name, and then inside the square braces, you list the data, and you list the functions. Here's their example, a class called rectangle. It's got two pieces of data. What do you care about a rectangle? The width and the length. I would call it width and height myself. And then they have some methods. Set width, set length, get width, get length, get area. Now notice these new words, private and public. Private means that that data cannot be accessed by the rest of your code. Public means it can. So in this rectangle class, you could not go in and you could, you could not change the width of that rectangle. You could not change the length of it. However, you could call set width because that function is public. It's listed under the public part. And if you call set width, it would hopefully change the width variable. And if you call set length, it would hopefully change the length variable. So public means that that variable or function can be accessed by stuff outside of the class. 
private means it can only be called from within the class. So with these two things declared as private, only code inside the class could change width and length or get a hold of them. And so that is a common technique for writing classes, a rule of thumb, data private, functions public, or methods public. Attributes are private, the behaviors of the methods are public. And the reason for that is you're keeping your data safe. You're not allowing anybody to make mistakes. You're not allowing them to try to set the width to a string or changing the width halfway through your calculations. So here's our example. These are the members. Our data are the members. And then these are the methods. He calls them members as well. I disagree. Okay. When defining a member function, put a prototype in the class declaration and then add some code to it. Now here's where the syntax starts to look really nasty and Java makes it a lot easier to do this than C++. But what we would do is we would say that there's a function called get area. We would stop it at that point. And then outside of that code we would say, okay, circle get area and we would define our function outside of it. So this is actually the prototype and then this is the function itself and I forgot to call it double. There we go. Looks kind of dumb doesn't it? Looks like this is declared twice. A lot of times you can get away with declaring it only once but this is the official way to do it. You declare the prototype for the method inside the class and then you put the method itself outside of the class. Usually this is in a header. What I should do is create a file called circle.h that contain that data. So if I was going to be a good boy, I would come over here and I would add onto my header files a new header. I would click header and I would call it circle.h and I would paste that into it. Now anytime I wanted to use that I would add an import statement and an include statement that included that. So I would go back into my code and now now these references to circle and radius and stuff like that are giving me errors. How do I fix that? I do include circle.h <clears throat> capital C You're not going to go away. Oh, that's right. It's in the same directory, so instead of using uh, angle brackets to look for it, you use quotes. And that made the errors go away. <clears throat> So here we go. To make a circle, we would give it its name like this. And now say we want to set that radius value. C1 dot excuse me. C1 dot radius is equal to 10. Now okay, I, I botched that. C1 dot radius. I put a 10. Still complaining about that. It says it's inaccessible. I need to go back into circle and see what I did wrong. I did not make anything public. So let's add the public keyword and let that radius be public and let get area be public. And here I change it. I create my circle just like building a house. And then I change the value of that variable that is contained within the circle class. I could create another circle too. Circle C2. C2's.radius would be equal to something else. Now I want to print out the area of those circles. C out, C1 area is equal to C1.get area. C out area, C2.area 
is equal to c two dot get area. And my guess is like half the class is getting this, and half the class their eyes are, are rolling up because I'm using terms that you've never experienced before, and that's okay. That's okay. We're going to talk about this again on Monday. I do want y'all to to leave the class with the idea of how. Not this class. I want you to leave the course knowing what a class is and how to create a simple class and how to use it. Let's make sure that this works. There we go. C1's area was 314, which is valid for a circle of radius 10. And C2's area was 1256, which is a valid area for a circle of C20. So you can see that each circle has both data. C2 has a data value called radius and it has functions also known as methods also known as behaviors sorry I like the term method method is a commonly used term across many programming languages however books also have to throw in other terms the uh, inventor of the C++ language liked the term behavior so that one gets used but there's a lot more object-oriented programming languages than just C++ and so different Computer scientists come up with different terms for it. Okay, so to recap, what is a class? A class is a data structure to contain data and functions that act upon that data. This get area function acts upon the radius data in order to determine the area and return it so that we could print it out. You don't have to have data in a class. You can make a class that has no data, but then why did you make a class? You could make a class that has no functions. But then again, why are you storing the data if you're not going to do anything with it? So, collection of data, excuse me, it's a, it's a data structure that has member variables known as attributes and functions known as methods or behaviors. If I was going to burn that in and want you to memorize it, I'd put the, an explanation up here at the top that says something like that. What is a class? class is a data type that supports information, variables known as attributes or members, and functions that act upon that information. You know, return that value, change that value, whatever, which are methods also known as behaviors. Okay, that's what a class is. What is a object? An object is an instance of the class. Where's my object? Here's my object. C1 is an instance of the circle class. C1 is a circle. Sarah is an instance of a human. So is, so is Jeff, the professor. This is an instance of a Slotsky's cup. So the instance, the object, the word instance means one copy of. You know, you have one example of. Here we have two examples of it because we created two circles. So we have two objects. We have a C1 object and a C2 object, and they each contain different data. One contains a radius of 10. The second one contains a radius of 20. We could create 500 different circle objects, each one with a different radius. So we're not just limited to processing one radius at a time. We could stick all of those circle objects into an array and then send that array to be processed and we could add up all the areas. All right, let's create a Dropbox for the first part of the assignment that we did because I really wasn't expecting anybody to type along when I was creating the class. We'll do that on Monday.